Welcome to Casual Friday. Hi, I'm Roxanne Richardson, and this is my weekly Casual Friday podcast. If you'd like to jump right to a specific point in the video, you can tap or mouse over the video playback area of the screen to reveal the chapter titles and starting points of each section. In this week's podcast, I have tidbits. I have an update to my ongoing hand spinning fiber breed study. I'll also show you how I did an update to this 14 year old sweater that I'm wearing today, and I'll have a channel update. So let's get started. This first tidbit is from a really interesting website. It's from I'm probably not pronouncing this correctly. This is one of those not a real word situations. I believe it's iTextilists or it could be iTextilists. I really don't know how it would be pronounced. It's a division of the IK Workshop Society, which is a global and unique forum for all those interested in natural and cultural history. From a textile perspective, they add on when it's in respect to this iTextilis. So they have lots of natural and cultural history stuff, and then the iTextilis or iTextilis section relates specifically to textiles. And the essay that I saw this week was written by Vivica Hansen, and it is about lace makers and handicraft from 1750 to 1775. And so they're talking about how the craft of lace making expanded across Europe and also how there, there are different images from paintings where people are depicted with different kinds of lace and what wearing a large amount of lace would mean in terms of your status in society and also spoke about the sumptuary laws that would prohibit people of certain social classes from wearing lace or wearing very much of it. And in Sweden, there was even an effort to prevent the aristocracy from, from going too far overboard with all of their excessive extravagant use of lace. So it's an interesting article and uh, I found it really cool to read about. And in particular, just the, the website in general looks like it's really interesting. So I will leave links down in the show notes to the various things that I'm mentioning. This next tidbit is information uh, for a Zoom web webinar that you could uh, watch. It's on November 2nd at noon central daylight time here in the United States. Keep in mind, I'm saying daylight time. We have not gone off daylight saving time here yet, and we won't until November 7th. So noon central daylight time would be 5 p.m. UK standard time or 6 p.m. a European central European time or whatever whatever it is um, in Western Europe. So just keep that in mind that the time difference it might not be what you're typically used to. So the topic is weaving connections, new interpretations of historical American textile design. And so they're going to be um, doing a brief like slideshow of several different uh, coverlets that were created in the late 18th century, early 19th century, and how those influenced uh, different political expressions and weaving apparently. So I will leave links where you can read more about this and, and you can register for the event as well if that's of interest to you. This next tidbit came to me in my Twitter feed and it's the latest episode of so what podcast. So I will leave a link to the actual uh, tweet uh, where I, I was able to listen to the podcast from that particular tweet, but it's a podcast that's available in a number of different places. So it's, it's an audio podcast, but she includes um, visual images of the things that she's talking about on all her different social media accounts. The topic is Eastern European needlework. And so that includes embroidery as well as knitting. So she does talk briefly about Latvian mittens, for example. And again, you can see images of the different things that she's talking about. And she kind of goes through a specific regions of Eastern Europe and she briefly describes what she's 
including an, as a definition of Eastern Europe for the purposes of this particular uh, podcast. I, I thought it was pretty interesting. And again, she's got a, a podcast where she interviews people apparently sometimes. But this was one where she basically was just um, giving a an essay about these different things. So it was just her. And these are a little shorter. It's about 20 minutes long. This last tidbit is also an event. Uh, it's an in-person but also virtual event. So you, you, if you are in that location in the UK, you could go to it. Uh, the, I, there doesn't appear to be any difference in cost, although if you go in person, it sounds like they feed you. The event is the, the Textile Society Annual Conference. So uh, it's an in-person event. However, virtual attendee tickets are available for those wishing to attend online. The conference is 10.45 a.m. to 5 p.m. UK time. And it's, it, they explore the theme of tools their significance in the history of textiles and their influence on contemporary practice from the simplicity of a darning needle held in the back pocket to the complexity of an industrial power loom. Tools are the extension of our creativity, a connection between thinking and making, imagination and invention. And when you go to the link, you can see all the different people who are speaking and what sorts of things they're going to be speaking about. So the range in price that they say is 29 pounds to 89 pounds. Uh, the 29 pound range is if you are a student. If you are a member of the Textile Society, it's 59 pounds, whether you're in person or virtual. And if you are not a member of the Textile Society, it's 89 pounds, virtual or in person. A lot of the events that I tell you guys about are free, but not all of them are because it does cost money to make these things happen. Links to everything I've mentioned are down in the show notes. Back in June, I wanted to get back into hand spinning. I'd learned to spin about three summers ago and I had done it quite a bit that first summer and then very sporadically since then. So once I moved into my new office, the one I'm in now, which is much larger and I could contain my spinning wheel and fiber in my office with me and where I could see it every day, I had really been wanting to get back into spinning again. And I thought the best way or a way of doing that in a way that would be interesting and fun and give me the practice I needed was to do a fiber breed study. So I got a, a kit from Wool Gatherings on Etsy and it's a, it's a kit, a sampler kit of 30 different breeds of wool and it's one ounce of each combed top and ready to spin. And so I've been doing, uh, trying to do at least one per week. In some weeks I've done more than that. And sometimes uh, I've done uh, less than that, but not too often. Uh, but so far I have accumulated this bin full of, of different yarns that I've knit. Once I get all 30 breeds done, then I'm going to work out what exactly I'm going to do with them to, in order to see what I think of them um, for actual hand knitting. And I've been doing these alphabetically just to come up with a way of doing it sort of systematically. So this week, the breed that I spun was called Suffolk. So I'm gonna go to the overhead and show you what that uh, finished yarn looks like and also a little bit about my impressions of spinning with that particular breed of wool. This week's fiber in my fiber breed study is Suffolk. Just like last week's South Down breed, this is what is called a Down breed. And Down refers to the region of England where these breeds uh, originated. So South Down was the very first Down breed and Suffolk came sometime later. It's been around at least for a couple of hundred years. So I was really happy when I pulled this out of my box of fiber to see that it was this sort of natural grayish brown color. It's it's fun to break up the monotony of cream colored uh, wools with a colored wool. In most cases, I spin the fibers from this breed study using what's called a short forward draw, which is a worsted drafting method. But occasionally I've been using the long draw, which is a woolen spun, which is a method of spinning woolen. And that 
requires the fibers to be more disorganized. So for previous breeds where I've used the long draw method, I have run the top through my carter, my drum carter, and then, and then used it to spin. But with both the South Down and with the Suffolk, I just had a sense and I couldn't articulate to you why, but there is just something about the way the wool sat in the top where it just seemed to me like this, this seems like wool that I could just do a long draw with. And so I did that without carding and I did that for the South Down and I did it for uh, the Suffolk as well. And it seemed to work uh, pretty well. I, I spun it as a two ply after finishing it with a, a dunk in the warm water and dunk in cold water and then whacking it on a hard surface. It, it you know, blooms up and it, and it looks like real yarn. So what surprised me was how much this fiber, this wool shed while I was spinning it. I just had little hairs all over my lap. And the wool itself looked pretty hairy just in the top. And I don't know if you can see. So I believe this is what is called Kemp. And I had never heard of Kemp until I did this fiber breed study. I'd never encountered it when I had done any spinning before. Uh, and perhaps that's because the breeds that I was spinning weren't prone to having Kemp, or maybe they had been processed in a way that eliminated all of it. But I have encountered it occasionally in some of the breeds in this fiber breed study. But some of these are, are just types of breeds I had never spun before. Some are primitive breeds and some are like these down breeds. So there were quite a, quite a, a, a few bits of Kemp that still remain in the yarn. I didn't try pulling it all out. I didn't try doing anything to remove it all. Uh, I don't know a lot about Kemp. That's part of the process. The part of the reason for doing a fiber breed study is just to get more experience in knitting or in spinning in different situations. What did surprise me though, based on all of the Kemp and how hairy it was and, and how it was shedding, was how soft the yarn actually turned out. It's pretty squishy. And also it just doesn't feel that rough. It's not, certainly not like merino, like it's buttery soft, but it just, it just feels like what I would call like real wool. It feels like something that I could totally knit a sweater with certainly a sweater where I'd have to wear a shirt underneath it. Like most of the sweaters I knit are that way, uh, regardless of how soft they are. But it just seems like it would be really good for something like that. Some of these breeds that I have spun that have been really coarse or uh, haven't had much crimp in them, just are really ropey when they're done. But this is not. And, and I think part of that was the sense that I had when I was dealing with the top where there's just something about it where the top, the fiber in the top seemed really springy. And I thought, oh, well, this might be good for a, a long draw. And it was. I don't know enough about this breed or about spinning yet to know how all of these factors together are going to combine to make a yarn that's nice to knit with. I won't be knitting with this until all of the breeds are, are done. I am in the in the S's. I think my next one is going to be with a T and I'm not sure which breed that is. There's a few there. Tar Targhi for sure and maybe Teasdale. So if it's Targhi that will probably be next. But there are quite a few uh, breeds left to go. Maybe maybe 10 more to go in this 30 breed study. So it's it's continues to be really fun. Many of you who have been watching this channel for a while may recognize the sweater that I am wearing today, but it does have something a little bit different about it that it didn't used to have, and that is it has a new neck. So I think the last time I wore this sweater may have been back in March. I found a little clip from a video uh, from this past spring where you can see um, me wearing it. And you can see that the neck is quite a bit wider and also the ribbing is, is fairly shallow in there. You, uh, you can see my t-shirt in there clearly. I knit this sweater, I started knitting this sweater in the end of November-ish of 2005. It was part of a, it was called Follow the Leader Aaron Knit Along. 
And it was done by Janet Zabo, who was pretty well known at the time in terms of a cable and Aaron uh, sweater design. And she was writing a, a book, a new book on Aaron sweater design, and she wanted to do this knit along in conjunction with it. Well, this was prior to Ravelry. This was uh, the year that I kind of came back to knitting after a few years hiatus. And so I was involved in various email groups that were devoted to sock knitting and other types of knitting. I had local knitting groups I was involved with. I was, had started the master hand knitting program. I was just learning an incredible amount about knitting in that particular year because my horizons had been expanded like they never had in the 19 years previous in my knitting life when I was an isolated knitter and only knew what to do based on what the pattern told me to do. So what this particular sweater pattern was about was that first of all Janet chose all of the stitch patterns. So she had figured out how to do this front panel with the different cables and what the layout was. Participants in the knit along were free to swap out cables I personally uh, chose to uh, change the direction of the cable in the center. There are three that were identical and she had them all the same direction and I flipped one upside down. Uh, many people just were using the knit along to kind of understand the process of figuring out how to knit something that fit you the way you wanted and had the kind of neckline that you wanted. Because that's really what it was about. She chose the, pat the stitch patterns, which is very it's, it's a skill on, unto its own within sweater design, picking all of the, the uh, cable patterns. So we didn't have to worry about that, but what we were choosing to do was what kind of neck we wanted, how, how deep we wanted the sleeves, what kind of filler stitch we wanted on the sides. Let me stand up so you can see. So with a cable sweater, typically you have this, these, all these panels that go shoulder to shoulder, and then the, what you have on the sides is a filler stitch right here that has a very small repeat. I, I used moss stitch, the US moss stitch, which is knit one purl one across a row, but you have and up the columns, it's two knits and two purls. In the UK, they would call that a double moss stitch or sometimes Irish moss stitch. So I chose, it, it's a very, very small repeat, so very easy to make as big or as small as you want it. And so that's what you do with the filler. And so if you need something that's much larger in circumference, you just add more filler stitch because shoulders don't tend to be a whole lot wider or narrower. There is some variance, but there's more variance in the total circumference. So we were figuring out our filler stitches and she showed us how to do all of the gauge swatching for a cable sweater. And then she taught us how to knit this um, top down. So it has these uh, straps right here that you start with. You start with the shoulder straps and and then you are knitting like the back and then you start knitting the, the front down to the armholes uh, and creating the, the shaping that you want for the neck. So I wanted a crew neck. Some people wanted a v-neck. Some people wanted a cardigan. So you could have whatever kind of neck and she kind of guided you through the process of figuring out how deep you want your neck and how to shape it and how to do all of that. So we we're being guided through this process. It was an incredible learning opportunity because it was really a nice bridge from strictly following a pattern to learning to design without having to, with being, being guided through that design process and not having to choose the stitch patterns entirely, just choosing a filler stitch. She would release a PDF at the beginning, it was probably every week or two as in the beginning process, like here are the stitch patterns, here's how you need to swatch, you need to do measurements, here's how you need to do all that. And then they would get uh, spaced out further along as you got into like the body of the sweater where you didn't need any directions, you just needed to keep going, um, there weren't PDFs. And then finally the last PDF was released in June that told how to do all the finishing. Well. This is a big project and I was in a period of time where I was really excited about learning a lot of different things. So I'd work on it for a while and then I would put it to the side. Particularly did not want to work on it during the summer when it would be sitting on my lap. So it took me a couple of knitting seasons, winter knitting seasons to get this finished. And the very last thing that I finished was the neck. So this very last thing, everything was completely done. I just needed to do the neck. So I, I, I calculated how many stitches, I planned it all out, I picked up the stitches, and I was so anxious to get this, this sweater done. I wanted a fold over collar, so I would have to knit it 
twice as long in order to fold it over and then sew it down on the inside. And I told myself that two inches was enough. And that would give me a one inch neck and that would, that would be enough. And, uh, and I just wanted to be done with the sweater. I was so excited about it. Well, I decided that I didn't want it to be too tight. So I wasn't going to bind off the live stitches. Instead, I would sew them off. So I take a live stitch off the needle and you know, I'd run my uh, threaded yarn needle uh, through a single stitch and then I would stitch it to the inside fabric and then I'd take the next live stitch and I went all the way around like that. And I was so happy I got it done. I tried it on and I thought, oh, I don't like the neck. It's too wide. And I, I just, it, I felt like it exposed my neck too much. I have short hair, my neck is exposed, I live in Minnesota, I like my neck to be warm. And I realized over the course of the 15 years since I was knitting this sweater that necklines have really gotten a lot wider. A lot of people really like that, that's very fashionable. And I couldn't care less <laughs> if it's fashionable. I don't like exposed skin because it makes me cold. It just means that if I'm sitting at my desk near a window when it's you know, 20 degrees below zero outside, I'm going to feel that cold radiating and I'm going to be cold. And I, then I'll have to wear a scarf inside and I don't want to do that. So I want my neck, uh, I want the neck to be more closely fitted. So for years it bugged me and my skills in knitting increased. And I thought, oh, I just really would like to re-knit that, uh, that neck, but I didn't have any leftovers of the yarn. Couldn't find any in any of my bins of leftover balls. And so I thought, well, I'm just uh, stuck with that. Then last year, as I was uh, moving into this office and reorganizing everything and going through all of my swatches and that I have that I use sometimes for teaching and for other purposes, I realized that I had the original swatch for the sweater. And that was probably enough to re-knit the neck or at least to add additional length. So this is a fold over neck that had been worn for 14 years. And I was a little worried about just adding length that there would be like a crease line in it. Like it would just wouldn't work well. And so I might need to just re-knit the entire neck. And I thought there's a good chance that this would be enough. Well, now this has been inside a bin of swatches and it's kind of gotten rubbed over the years. So it's a little fuzzier on the surface. Whereas this sweater is like in perfect condition because I knit it at a really firm gauge. It doesn't pill. It looks perfect. It looks brand new, uh, which is one of the things I love about the sweater. So I thought, well, there's potential uh, that I do have some extra yarn. Um, maybe I could rip this out, steam it, combine the two yarns together. Somehow I could do that. So during the course of organizing this new office, realizing what my organizational style was, having these epiphanies, I got into an organization frenzy and I went down to our uh, front closet that's near our front door. We call it the family closet. It's a walk-in closet that has shelves. It's got racks for hanging up all the coats that we have in Minnesota. Uh, it's got the vacuum cleaner. It's got, you know, light bulbs. It's, you know, it's got all the household extras plus, you know, kids games and all kinds of stuff. Well, my kids have been grown and out of the house for years. So I went through that closet and completely reorganized it. And as I did that, I realized there was a bag of yarn leftovers that I had put in that closet years ago, intending to take to the knitting group that I was part of while my kids were in school. My youngest daughter is 24. <laughs> so this is more than six years ago uh, that I put that bag in there and the knitting group dissolved and but that bag just sat in there for years. And so I saw it and I thought, oh, because I just recently, I think found this and was thinking about redoing that. I'm like, I wonder if I have that red yarn in that bag and I dug through it and I found that I had a ball of leftover yarn um, from this sweater. Sat here all summer because I couldn't wear this sweater during the summer so I had no motivation to fix it. Well now the temperatures are cold here in Minnesota. It's fall and um, and I'm wearing sweaters every day. And I was thinking, I really want to wear this. So, so the other day I ripped out the neck and I re-knit it. But first I kind of sat down and evaluated what I thought the problem with the neck was versus what was actually the problem with the neck. 
I thought maybe I had just picked up too many stitches for the neck so that the neck was just too big that and it was causing the neck to open wider and causing it to spread but I took out my original notes I have all my original uh, notes including my original chart that I drew out for planning my uh, the, the neck shaping I have this uh, this notebook of all the PDFs so I have the original instructions that uh, explained how to do the neck and I saw that the number of stitches that I'd used was really right on target the problem, I thought, was twofold. One, I just didn't knit the neckband long enough. I got impatient and it made it too shallow. And that's part of why the neck um, was so wide open. And secondly, by sewing the live stitches off the needle and into the fabric so that it would be stretchy enough to like go over my head, I didn't want it to be too tight. I had overcompensated, I had overdone it, it was too stretchy. So the neck was a little wider than it should be and then it was so stretchy it would just easily open up. So I'm gonna to go to the overhead, I'm gonna show you what it looked like originally and then I'm gonna show you at a, you know, a couple of different stages during the process uh, what I ended up doing. So what I want to do is take out this this ribbing and then re-knit it with fewer stitches. There were two issues with this neck. One was that I felt like the ribbing was too shallow and the second was that the opening was too big and I felt too stretchy. It was like pulling apart. So what I decided to do was to knit this deeper the way I should have. So I knit it for three inches so that when it would fold over it would be an inch and a half in length. And I tried it on during the course of knitting this ribbing and, and folding it to see what that would look like and how much it would close up the opening. And I was really happy with it. The second thing I decided to do was to actually use a real bind off because a, the, a bind off isn't stretchy. It isn't very stretchy. And I actually wanted, I want this to have some stability so that it doesn't open up too much. The opening is plenty big to go over my head and to fit around my neck. The ribbing and the cable fabric stretches more than, th than this does. This does stretch a little bit, so it can stretch enough to uh, expand over my head a little bit, but it's going to uh, just give that extra stability that the filling it in and the giving the extra stability is my hope. So what I have here is a knit to purl to ribbing and I have it folded over and I've clipped it together along the path because what you see on one face of the fabric is the opposite of the other and it's very tempting to try to line up this a knit to column with say a, this knit to column right here. Wait, let me unclip this. So if I look on this side right here, I have this column of knits. I want those to be aligned but if I look at it from this side, you can see that I have, these are pearls on this side that are lined up with the knits on here. So I like to, to clip things uh, along the way around the neckline so that I know that I'm, I'm keeping things lined up. It would be very easy, especially if, you, if you're right at the edge and you really can't see what's going on, it'd be very easy to get off and have things twisted and then you'd have to take it out. So I have started sewing it down and I will continue all the way around. So this is the neck uh, completed. I've sewn it in. Uh, I tried it on and it does, you know, it, it, it when I pull it over my head, I, it's not completely loose. Like it's going, it's like putting a hat on. It feels snug as it's going past my head and then it comes around my neck and it fits perfectly fine. But it is, I, there's no struggle getting it on to my head at all. And uh, I like the way that the collar fills in more um, when it's an inch and a half deep rather than uh, one inch deep. So I much prefer this. Now I'll see how it wears. Uh, I, I, I haven't washed or blocked this at all. So typically what happens when you wash uh, knitted fabric, it will achieve more drape. So this could lose some of its, uh, not stiffness, but its stableness um, once it's washed. And if that's the case, and it seems to like it still wants to pull a little bit too much, then I can use a trick just along the back of the neck uh, which is to work 
some slip stitch crochet. I've done a video on that in the past. I'll link uh, above and also down in the show notes. But uh, if I need more stability across here for some reason, then I can I can add that uh, later if I need to. But otherwise, I'm I'm very happy with the way that this turned out. The key learning point I got during this whole reorganization and going through all my swatches and searching and searching for leftovers for this yarn and thinking I, I didn't have it and, and there wouldn't be a really good way to fix this neck was that as I was going through all my yarn, anytime I encountered a ball of leftovers that was associated with a sweater that I currently wear, I put it in a bag and I keep I keep those leftovers now so that if there's some point in the future where I decide I want to change something or repair something that I will have that yarn because one of the other things um, that has come up in the past year or so in some of my older sweaters is that they've gotten kind of thin in the elbow and that comes from me, the way I sit at my desk chair on with my arm uh, on elbow on there and I, I sit like that when I'm knitting and I kind of rotate my arm it's just it, it's in this position, it's constantly rubbing on that. The things are getting a little bit thin in the elbow, and so uh, I need to, to reinforce that a little bit or possibly put some uh, elbow patches on. So uh, this, these are things that I'm thinking about uh, as I'm knitting sweaters now. In the past, I never cared about preserving yarn because I, I just hadn't encountered a time when I needed to fix something. With socks, I have so many pairs of hand knit socks that by the time something wears out in the sole, it's set seven to 10 years old and they're kind of ratty all over and then they just, uh, just get rid of them. I don't care, I have enough other pairs of socks. But some of the sweaters that I have, I really love like this one and I want to make sure that I can save those sweaters in the future with some of the original yarn. So I am keeping those in a separate bag now uh, just for that purpose. I wanted to give you guys an update. Last week I was telling you I was thinking about possibly increasing the number of Technique Tuesday videos I publish and to offset the time that that would take, I was going to reduce the amount of time, or the, reduce the length of Casual Friday videos in weeks when I was doing both videos. So I do think that I am going to reduce the length of Casual Fridays on weeks when I do Technique Tuesday videos. I just think that in terms of sanity and time management, all that, that makes the most sense. What I have decided to do is to not increase the number of Technique Tuesday videos that I'm going to do. So I'm gonna keep at the same pace. Things might change. There might be an odd week here and there that I'll just be so inspired and I'll wanna, for whatever reason, produce an extra Technique Tuesday video. I don't know. But it was through all the comments and seeing what people really appreciated um, they just appreciated the existence of Casual Friday and it was fine with them if it was 30 minutes and not 45 minutes. And I, of course I'm asking my Casual Friday audience this question. And the Casual Friday audience is not necessarily the same as the Technique Tuesday audience. There's some people who watch both videos as soon as they come. Any video that I produce, they watch it. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if they need the Technique video at that time. It doesn't matter if they think they understand how to do that technique already, they watch it and learn something from it. There, there's that group of people. Then there's the people who only watch Casual Friday. They, they either don't need or want to watch Technique videos or experienced enough, they just don't feel the need for them. Um, or there's people who will watch a Technique video when it pertains to a project they're working on. And if it happens to pertain to a project in the week that it's, that it's published, they're like, yay, that was good timing. But if they need a, a Technique video for a project and they just are looking for something to help them, they'll just search. I have enough backlist of technique videos. Often there is one there that they can refer to to help them with their project. So YouTube provides me with the ability, it's called, they call it analytics, the ability for me to kind of look and compare uh, videos and see what people are watching or what countries they're from, what the demographics are, how many subscribers I got from a particular video, all of that kind of thing. And I can see how many views I have on all my different videos. So at this point in the life uh, span of Casual Friday, there is a core group of people who just wait for Casual Friday. And as soon as it's published, 
they uh, watch it or they watch it over the weekend when they have to, when they have time, but they know it's there and they watch it every week. And so at the time that a Casual Friday video is published uh, versus at the time that a technique video is published, the Casual Friday videos will 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 get more views typically in the first couple of days because those are subscribers. Those are people who are waiting for these videos. So you might subscribe to my channel and be interested in my technique videos, but if it isn't something that you're interested in, you're not going to watch it right away. Where the, the casual Friday, you're like, I don't know what she's going to talk about today. I want to see. It'll be something interesting. But over the course of a couple of weeks, they even out. So you get about the same number of views you'll I'll see in the Technique Tuesday videos. If you look at the videos from a year ago that were published in the same time, the Technique Tuesday videos are probably double. There's certainly more than whatever the Casual Friday was and, and potentially double. So the Casual Friday videos typically are watched in the majority of, of viewers are subscribers where Technique Tuesday videos are over time, they continue to accumulate views because people are searching for a technique video and they find it on my channel. They may or may not be a subscriber. So the majority of viewers who watch a Technique Tuesday video are not subscribers. So it's a very different thing that I'm doing. So I think what was driving me to think that I wanted to do more Technique Tuesday videos was just driving views at this time of year when people are ramping up with their knitting um, and also hoping that I would get new subscribers from those videos because I am I recently got like 80 I hit the 80,000 subscriber view and I can see a hundred thousand on the on the horizon so I was thinking about things that are what I normally think about in terms of my channel. I was thinking about driving views and, and, and earning revenue and getting these 100,000 subscribers. And that is not what drives me to, that's not what motivates me in this channel. I am not doing this YouTube channel in order to make money. I do make money off of my channel and I'm happy to make money off of my channel, but that isn't the reason that I have this channel. So I very rarely uh, even, mention the different ways that I earn money. I mention it usually once or twice a year. You'll see it every video at the, if you watch a video to the very end and you see the end screen, I will mention, it will say something like support, support me on Kofi.com. Uh, and then in the show notes, there'll be a buy me a coffee and then a, a link to Kofi.com. So Kofi, it's becoming more like Patreon. It started out as like a tip jar type of idea where you could buy a coffee for something and you do it through PayPal. And you, I, as a creator, set what the price of my coffee is, which I set at $3. And so people could buy, buy me a coffee. They could buy me a coffee or they could buy me multiple coffees. And then over time, they changed it so that a person who wanted to buy a coffee could set an exact amount. You could, you could change it to, instead of being an increment of three, you could just say $5 or $10 or $50 or, you know, whatever. And, and send it, you know, directly. It goes through PayPal. I have to pay PayPal fees. That's no surprise, but I don't pay anything to Kofi, except that I do pay $60 a year to Kofi so that if people want to be a subscriber or have a, a membership um, and have automatic payments to me every month, like they want to buy me a coffee every month. So like they want to donate $3 to me every month, then they can do that. And, and in order for me to have that ability, uh, I have to pay Kofi $60 a year, which is more than worth it um, to do that. So that's one way that people can financially support me directly. Uh, another way is that YouTube places ads in videos. And as a, a channel owner, I can control whether or not uh, I, first of all, have monetized my channel. Uh, secondly, where I want ads to be placed or not placed. So I never want any mid-roll ads. I don't want, once the video starts, I don't want it getting interrupted with ads. That is my right. <laughs> if I have 
any video that's eight minutes or longer, I could, there could be multiple spots where there were ads. And I just think that's gross and I don't want to do it. Uh, if somebody else needs to do that because that's, they depend on that income and, and it works for them, that's fine. But I have chosen not to do that. The, the only place where ads would show up would be at the beginning of a video or at the very end of it. Uh, and that's just how I have chosen to do that. And I, any of the revenue that's generated from those advertisements, I get slightly more than 50%. I think I get about 55% of that ad revenue where YouTube gets 45%, which is fair. This is a free site for you to watch videos. It's a free site for me to upload videos and reach the entire world of knitters. And they provide me with all kinds of tools and analytics in order to, to make this process easier. So it's not unfair. It's unpleasant to watch ads. Uh, I subscribe to YouTube Premium, which I think is like $15 a month or something like that. And that way I don't have to watch any ads. And a portion of my uh, subscription fee to YouTube Premium goes to the creators whose videos I watch. They divide it based up on the amount of time that I spend watching any given um, channel. They'll divide up my subscription fee that way. So even though I'm not being fed ads, those creators are still getting revenue. So uh, those are those are the two main ways that I get revenue. YouTube just added this new ability, like right below the, the where you can see the thumbs up and the thumbs down and the subscribe button. There's right underneath the video playback screen. There's all those little like icons. They've provided the option for creators to have one that shows a little heart with a dollar sign in it that says thanks next to it. And that's a way for if somebody like was watching a video of mine and they really liked it, it helped them or they just thought it for whatever reason, they could click on that and they could pay however much they wanted to that creator. So it, it's faster than like going to Kofi and doing it but YouTube takes the same percentage that they would have ad revenue. So if you were to send me $5, I would get like $3 of that and YouTube would get $2 of that. Uh, but I just put it on there because there are people who occasionally aren't subscribers and they, you know, find a technique video and like, oh my God, this, this say, and it's just easy for them to click on that thanks button and, and send $5 in appreciation. So there's, those are those things. And then I do have a small number of patterns on Ravelry that I sell that um, people can buy. I don't, I'd probably make a lot more money if I, if I produced more patterns. I just don't find that to be as interesting as just learning things and sharing that with people. So there's always potential for me to make a lot more money off my channel than I do, but I just don't choose to do that because that is not what motivates me and as I discovered in the past week when I did start thinking about that it made me kind of uncomfortable and icky and I didn't know what to do and it just took getting your comments about what it is that you enjoy about my channel and how you use it and what you think of it um, that that made me realize why I was thinking about doing things differently so I really appreciate all of that feedback and um Thank you. I'm really, really happy um, to have all of you show up every week. Well, that's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week.